Are you just seeing the full screen or the presenter yeah, view? You're good. Okay, great. Okay, as Alina said, my name is Corey Jensen. I've been at the SHPO since 1998. And um, since Roger Roper, who hired me back then, just retired, I guess that makes me the oldest one in our office. But I'm still young at heart. So um, anyway, I enjoy working with these folks and appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today about um, the National Register and researching historic buildings. Um, so we thought this would be good for you. I don't know how many of you do research buildings, but it's good for you to know the process and maybe this will encourage you to, to research buildings on your own. Um, this is a presentation that was put together. It was started by Roger and then I kind of took it over and um, added some things and it kind of roughly follows the path of one particular building that's the um, the Dewey Hotel in Deweyville, Utah, the Box Elder County. But we're going to use that kind of as our basic example um, of a property as you go through the whole process to, to research. So, um, oops. okay. And this is the, uh, the Friar, sorry, the Friar Hotel, not the Dewey Hotel. So this was a photo of the, the Friar Hotel circa 1985, I think. It's kind of a cool building. Um, and it's, it's kind of located out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's in an area that's kind of hard to research. If any of you have ever done research on historic buildings, um, especially doing a title search, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, can be very confusing if you're in a rural area compared to a city area, which is set up typically in lots and blocks. In rural areas, you have a lot of farmland that has been designed, divided up and it follows a meets and bounds, what they call type of property description. So um, it, it can make things difficult, but um, it can also be uh, very rewarding as you go through the process. Um, here's just a little screenshot of what our uh, title search form looks like. This is a form that just helps you keep track of property, the, the properties as it's changed hands over time. And the main reason you have to do a title search is that provides all of the historic ownership of the property. Um, that's the main thing you're looking for, especially if you're researching uh, a residence um, because it's the owners that you're looking for the history of who lived in this building. Now, when you're doing a title search, you typically look at what's called a title abstract. And if you've been doing this for a while uh, before everything went online and that's the scanned and online versions are only in a handful of counties right now. Uh, most of the rural counties still have the, the um, title abstract books that you have to look through. These books are giant. They're like, you know, two feet by a foot and a half and they weigh about 30 pounds. And if you're at the Salt Lake who um, laminated all the pages in theirs, they weigh about 500 pounds. So you need a gorilla in there to help you lift them around. Luckily, um, Salt Lake, um, I think most of the, the Wasatch Front counties and the, the larger counties have uh, scanned their information and you can search it. And I know Salt Lakes, you can search online if you pay a monthly fee. But if you just want to go to the recorder's office and do it there, you can just do it on their computers there for free. Um, the so the title search I typically I usually recommend that you start with the most recent ownership and work your way backwards. Um, that helps you work from the smallest to the largest size of property. Um, most of these properties started out as huge plots, um, several acres, just depending on what whatever the standard lot size was at the time that they were recorded for the first time. And then over time, these these parcels get um, parceled off either for infill or just um, for development of what, uh, whatever. And that's where um, your title search becomes kind of tricky. And sometimes when I would do this, it's been a lot of time since I've actually done this as a consultant, but I would just roughly dry out the description as best I could based on the measurements that they provide in the um, parcel description, the, the legal description for the property. And then, um, 
because they'll provide you know so many rods or chains which are different measurements and it's good to know what those are how much uh, how long a rod is and how long a chain is these go back to very early days centuries ago um, just draw a rough map as you read the description and then as you go to the next um, ownership where maybe the property description changes and they sell off a piece i would have to redraw that that description just to make sure that the building that I'm researching is still on that parcel. Because over time, as I said, the property can be parceled off and um, another building built on the new parcel. And I, I've done this before, where I've started researching the original building and then the, the property changes because they've sold off a section of it. And not knowing it, I, I started researching the, the part that had been um, parceled off and get the history of a completely different property than what I was initially looking for. So it's very important to, to keep track of which piece of land you're, re, you're reviewing. And it's really hard to explain this. If you've never done a title search, it's hard to explain this just by talking. You have to actually be there. But um, when you do the title search, you can go to the county recorder's office. And um, if you have the parcel ID number, the, the tax ID number for the property, um, that's great. They can look it up that way. If you only have the address, they can still find what the tax ID number is, and then you can start there. And all the most recent ones are more likely going to be online or, or on a database that they would have. And you can start there, and then you just start working your way back. A lot of them um, went from the written books to microfilm um, back in the early 80s. So you can do a lot of it pretty easily just through the microfilm pages or on their computer system if you're there on site. And then prior to that, it all goes back to the um, to the uh, tax books. And that's where you're having to pull a separate book down, find that, um, look through the description, find your actual property in there. Um, I, I Probably the easiest county to research is um, Utah County because in all of their um, parcel books, they would have, they would show you which page to go to next because the pages don't just go in logical order. You're going from um, plat and block to a different um, section of the book um, that goes on later. And so it, it can get kind of confusing. Um, but that's why you start out the process with this because it always gets easier after the title search. So um, anyway, this little uh, photo I have here, um, shows this prior hotel and um, it starts back in 1891 when it was the property was owned by the Central Pacific Railroad and they sold it to the Tarpey family, DP and JA and so forth. You'll notice there, um, the one column says instrument or I-N-S-T-R, that stands for instrument and that's the type of document that they recorded it on. Um, so the type of instrument you're looking for for the ownership is a deed of some type and it's typically a warranty deed which is usually marked with a wd in the um, title abstract book as, as shown here so you can see all these changes of ownership over um, about a decade uh, with warranty deeds and then you get to they started recording the mortgages um, they used to do that in these um, title abstract books but um, they don't do that they stopped doing that several decades ago and then we get up to, um, so the Friars purchased it from the Hansons in, in 1900. And then um, you can see the mortgages. And then there was uh, a Bashua Friar who was a widow, um, granted the property to William Frierson in 1933. So the Friar family had this up till 1933. And I'm assuming, you know, I don't know if we set the protocol for questions during this, but if you have a quick question, I can answer those as we go along, or if you can hold off till the end and then I can answer your questions then. So um, after you've gotten the title search and you've noted all of the owners based on um, the deed, if it's noted as a warranty deed in the title abstract, that gives you an idea that they are the owner. Then there are a number of different resources that you look at to research those people and the property. So the first one is Sanborn Maps. And probably most of you know what those are. If not, you will learn. 
Next one are the general land office or the cadastral maps, which are now um, managed by the BLM. Tax file, photographs, and that's it. So, um, so the first thing, Sambor maps. If you can find one for the city or the area of the city that you're interested in, that you're researching, that's great. Um, these can be very useful in determining original materials and the footprint of the building you're researching, if there were any alterations to the building or if there were other outbuildings on the property. Um, they can also show what the general uh, neighborhood looked like at the time. Um, the Sanborn Paris maps were made available beginning in 1884 in Salt Lake City. That was the first area. They go back to, I think, um, the late 1700s, if I, re if I recall correctly. But these were, um, the Sanborn Paris Company started making these maps um, for insurance purposes. Um, that's why they are so detailed. Um, they show where the, the property is, uh, or where the building is on the property, how what their um, situation is compared to other buildings around it, because they were made for fire insurance companies, so they could know how to um, insure these properties. If there were dangers of, if you had several wood buildings next to each other and super close to each other, you know, if a fire occurred, that could like level a whole block or several blocks or whole cities as we know here in Utah. So um, that's why they also provided these color-coded maps to show the different materials the buildings were made out of. Um, they provide a number of other things. I'm not going, going to go into all the other codes. They make a key with each of the, the uh, map books, there's a key showing what all the numbers, all the symbols, um, the colors, um, how they note the uh, footprints of the building. You can see that there's dashed lines for the building footprint on some parts and then solid lines for others. Um, so they're, they're very useful. A lot of people have just done complete research, written articles about um, areas. Uh, there was um, his name, oh, what's his name? Um, Sorry, my, my mind's blank right now, but a uh, guy that used to work up at Special Collections at the Marriott Library at the University of Utah uh, was researching uh, Japantown and Chinatown in Salt Lake City just based on Sanborn maps and all the notations on them. So they're, they're very useful for researchers. They're not available for every community in the state, but most of the ones that were somewhat populated around the end of the, the 19th century and into the 20th century. And most of the maps were made up into the 1940s um, on a regular basis, they were updated. Sometimes they would just send these um, new updates for particular properties that you would just paste in the old map. And I've seen some of these before. So, um, and interestingly, a while back, we found several um, bound books of Sanborn maps in our collections uh, at the um, state history. And those were recently scanned and put online. The Marriott uh, Special Collect or Digital Collections has several of theirs, uh, most of them online as well. And this, um, this is what the search page looks like at the Marriott Library for the Sanborn maps. Our search page looks pretty much the same. Um, we've provided, actually most of this information I'm presenting today is all provided in our how to research form that if you want to contact me, I can send you a copy. It's also um, available on our website. So that's uh, Sanborn maps and they were updated in each community. I don't know what determined their updates. I'm sure there was there was some reasoning behind it, but it seems like it was about every, um, I don't know, six to eight years or, or more, they would update the full sets of these. So on that website from the drop down menu, you can choose which city you want. And this is the only year, this is a map from Milford, or, or sorry, from Helper. Um, there, it shows different thumbnails for each map and you go through. Um, and there's like a main page that has, um, that shows each page what section of the town that covers as well. Unfortunately, these only, they, they usually started um, the earliest maps are for the central part of the town. And then each year they would spread out a little more, but I don't think any of them cover a, an entire town. Maybe some of the smaller towns are completely covered in these Sanborn maps. 
So the next um, type of map is what's called a cadastral map. These were provided, as I mentioned, by the General Land Office, which was the early form of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and the, they were doing these before they actually came out with the USGS topo maps in the mid 20th century. And so surveyors would go out and these cover most of the rural areas of, of the state. So you won't see a lot of um, buildings on these, especially if it overlaps a, uh, um, a populated area. But these do provide information um, on buildings if they're built in a rural area. Not all of them, but sometimes they'll be noted on there. Um, they, uh, we found one property, Roger was doing a nomination for a property in Gunnison. And it was kind of on the outskirts of Gunnison in a, in a more um, rural agricultural area of that town. And there was no information really for it. And then they found a little dot on one of these cadastral maps. And so the date helped provide when that building was there. Um, and that was another thing about the, the Sambor maps. So you can compare earlier versions with later ones. And this can help you this determine either when your house was constructed or if it was altered over time. So if you go to the earliest map of the community um, and your house is in an area that has been covered and you don't see a building on that property, or you may see a footprint of a, of a building on the property that is no longer there. It might be in a different section of the property and was either demolished or altered with an addition on it or something. Um, and then you find the next map and all of a sudden you see the footprint of your building. That gives you kind of a span of years that can help you narrow down when your building was constructed. So there, there are a lot of different ways to use these maps. But anyway, back to the cadastral maps. This is kind of a general um, uh, how one looks. It's mostly landforms noted on these and roads and waterways. But also, as I know, they'll, sometimes there'll be a black dot that would note um, a, a building on the land. This is the BLM site where you can search uh, cadastral maps. It's a little more technical than the Sanborn maps. Um, you can set, select the township range and section uh, where you want to search, and then it goes, gets a little more detailed from there. Um, this is the search page. And then here's what, once you find your map, this is what comes up on the, the website. So again, if you're looking at more um, rural area research, these can be useful. So the next item on the on the list is um, the tax file. So every building, every property has a tax file. Um, and the tax files can have a lot of information on them that may not be that useful or understandable as you're researching the history of a building. This is a typical tax file. This is from Utah County for a property in Orem. And um, there's, there's some really basic information. Um, the, the most useful items you're looking for are right in the bottom center. That is the, um, the legal description of the property. And then part of that is covered up by the photograph of the property. Um, beneath that, you'll see a bunch of dashes and that's actually the footprint of the house. If you lift up the photo, you can see that footprint. And then in the upper left, um, you can see that it's um, right below those larger numbers. You'll see a little box there and it has year built on it. Uh, it says 1938. Um, average age and effective age, those are um, tax terms. And I, I've been explained what those are what, uh, once before, but we don't really need to know those as long as you get the year built. Um, and then, so one cru crucial piece of information regarding the year built on a tax uh, file is that you can't always trust it, especially the farther back you go. The, the further in time back prior to around 1910-ish, that date on there on the tax form might not be accurate. And that's because um, I think it just had to be with, had to do with, um, how they recorded property information. If you go to, um, whoops, wrong direction. So here's an earlier tax form that they started back in the 1930s when they first started these um, tax assessment forms. And if you can look, let me see if I can pull up my pointer here. Let's see. 
So this area right here, um, this shows how the date was derived by the tax assessor. You can see, um, I'm having a hard time reading it, but um, basically you can, they, they got the, um, the date of the property construction, either from records, from neighbors, from tenant or the owner or an estimate. And so that tells you right there, they didn't have real accurate ways of determining a property's construction date um, prior to the, the early um, 1900s. And so um, the, that's why you have to use other ways to try to come up with the, the construction date of the property using items like the Sanborn maps and family histories, that kind of thing. I really like these older tax assessment forms. They provided a lot of information that was very useful. Um, so other than the, the construction date, you also had a nice drawing of the footprint of the building with basic um, you know, feet measurements and then little notes on what, how the um, property was constructed, especially the foundation. And then also a detail of other buildings. Um, this one had a granary on it um, with a dirt floor and uh, made of, it was 12 by 16 feet had shingle and it was 35 years old. There was a barn, a coop, tin roof. Um, so these were great if you can find these. And I know the Salt Lake County Archive, if you um, search, if you Google Salt Lake County Archives, you can get um, information if, if the property had one of these existing when they stand it and it's available, um, you can get a copy of that for a small fee. Um, I would always recommend looking for these. Um, but other than that, the early, this is more likely what you're going to um, find in the tax file. <clears throat> I forgot to tell you that the, when you're doing the title search, you go to the county recorder's office to get a copy of the tax file, you go to the county assessor's office. And um, they're both in the same building and sometimes maybe even the same room. I know at Salt Lake, the assessor's office is right above the recorder's office. Um, so you'll get to know those, those rooms really well if you're researching properties. So that's the tax file, get a lot of information off of it. It can also help verify ownership. So whatever the date was, this was um, um, Meredith M.D. Boyle was the owner at the time. So you can use this to verify when you're doing your title search. You can go back to the date on this was, um, so 1937, I think, was the date of this tax card. And you can use that to verify what you have as the owner on your tax file during that year as well. Or sorry, on your title search. So the next item we use to um, research properties and also to help kind of date them are photographs. And photographs can be found in many places. Although if you don't know a prior owner, um, then it's, you know, they might be harder to find. Probably the easiest one to find is the tax assessment photos. And these may be the only photos that you are able to find for the property you're researching. And tax assessment photos have kind of changed over time. Um, the one you're seeing here was actually stapled to a tax assessment card. You can see the staple marks in there. And this dates to the late 1930s or early 40s. And the photographs were really great then. They're very clear. Um, the film they used was, was really good. Um, and we always see one, one curious thing in earlier tax assessment photos are what I call these men in hats. Or instead of men in black, um, you'll always see at least one man in a white shirt, black tie, and a hat in these photos. And these were the tax assessors. So they would go around to each property they were assessing, they would get a photograph of it, and then they'd write the, the parcel um, number of the property here. And these typically in most of the, the counties have changed over time. Um, or you may see a hand sticking in the frame, holding a little chalkboard with the parcel number written on it. So this is, um, this is a photograph of the, the Friar Hotel. And if you remember on that first color photograph, um, it, there wasn't a porch on it. 
So we know that at some point they added this very fancy Victorian porch with all this gingerbread trim on it um, in the early 1900s. Like I said, I think this photo dates from around the late 1930s. So that narrows down from um, the, the property construction around 1905 or whenever it was up to 1930, they put a porch on. Um, the, here's another photo, an earlier photo. And you can see there's no porch on it. And I think this is right after the, the property is first um, open for business. And it's curious, one way to date photos is if there are people in it, you can of course date by the clothing. Um, this looks like early turn of the, the 20th century type of clothing. Um, curious, uh, this photograph actually came from a glass plate slide or, or glass plate um, negative. So you can see a big chunk of the glass broke off here, um, which is why they switched to film. <laughs> it wasn't nearly as fragile as glass plates. But so we have two good photos of the Friar Hotel, the tax photo, and then this one. And you can see how new it looks. Those shingles look brand new on it. The paint looks brand new. Um, you can see they're probably still under construction prior to building the porch. It, the, the yard wasn't quite um, cleaned up that well, but um, it's a really nice photo. So if you can find photos, that's great. If you know, um, if you're researching the property and there are, uh, you know of some descendants of the people who lived in the house, you may want to hit them up, see if they have any old photos that may show the building. Um, but um, there, there are various sources you can go to. But typically the tax credit photo I found in my years in the Shippo is um, probably the only real sure bet. Um, they kept those up to date and they still keep them up to date. Um, usually they wouldn't update them until there was like a major um, like alteration or an addition put on the property. Uh, but now more so in the last 40 or 50 years, they would update the photo anytime it changed hands or whenever they had to reassess the, the property. Um, and so now they're just available all online at the assessor's office. Um, this particular um, type of photograph, like for Salt Lake County, you'd want to Google, you'd want to go to the Salt Lake County archives again and ask them to search, see if they have one of these earlier photos. I know in the past, um, Salt Lake, the, the Salt Lake County Assessor's Office, if you just search a property on there, <clears throat> you'll find little thumbnails of the, um, the older ones if they happen to scan them. Um, but they're not always the best quality. It's not like you can really download and print them off, which is why you have to go to the county archives, have them scan a better copy of it uh, for a fee. Sorry. Another type of uh, photo you can look for are aerial photos. Um, this is not one that I've, I've got much experience in at all is, is researching aerial photographs. I know some of our consultants use, have used these quite a bit in the past. And these started um, probably before World War II, they started doing aerial photographs, especially of rural areas. And I think these are available through the USDA. Um, and they use them kind of for surveying land um, in rural areas, farmland and, and so forth. Um, so these can be useful if you're researching a property again in a rural area, um, the same area you'd be using those cadastral maps for. This is a, a shot of um, Geneva Road here in Utah County, just by Utah Lake um, in Vineyard. Um, and this, this was used for a, a survey that was done there about 15 years ago. So you can see they superimposed um, buildings and addresses over the, um, the photograph for this survey. And, um, but these can show you land use over time. If you were to take a photo of the same area, I should, I should actually go to Google Earth and pull that up and add a comparative slide because I think this is pretty much all covered with homes now, homes and, and businesses. So they can provide a good snapshot of an area over time and how land use has changed which can help when you're researching a building. You can see when maybe subdivisions went into an agricultural area and how, if your property was there before, how it went, how it was kind of blended in with that newer um, urban development. And I forgot to add 
you know, what we use a lot now and what a lot of our consultants use is just um, Google Earth and the street view of that to look at the front of the building. Um, we've tried um, to incorporate those into um, uh, making surveys a little easier, although street view is not always um, that up to date in some areas, especially, especially rural areas. Um, we've staff at our office have surveyed lots of rural areas, especially in the central and southern part of the state. And I still go and look at theirs and they haven't updated their street view since 2008. And back then the quality of their street view was pretty bad. It was like super saturated colors and really fuzzy looking, but you can still get a, a pretty good idea of what the building looked like back then as compared to now. So uh, street view can be a pretty useful tool for all of this. So after you've looked at the physical characteristics, after you research those for the property, um, you're going to start re researching the ownership of the property and the history of it um, using biographical sources. Um, so of course, these include newspapers, uh, the Polk city directories, state gazetteers and phone books for businesses, obituaries and obituary files, census data, um, genealogy, of course, and biographical indexes and or indices and encyclopedias, and then um, local histories. So that's a lot of different sources you can look at. And all of these are available in our um, history research center at State History in the Rio Grande building, or I should say they were available um, and will be again someday. <laughs> if they ever get our building um, seismically upgraded, which should be happening in the next couple of years. But you can also find these resources if you live near a university or college, a lot of them have these in their reference centers and um, or versions of these. But you know, for the most part, all of this, all of this information is available online now in, you know, in varying degrees and in um, varying areas. So, um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you is from the actual hands-on um, searching method, but um, also if you search these online, um, you'll find much of the information you need. So the first one is newspapers. There's a lot of different things you can find out from newspapers, um, whether it's local historical information. A lot of the local papers would run a, a little history um, section. This is from the Lehigh Free Press in their Lehigh Yesteryears section. Um, and it just talks about a historic barn. And this can provide some, some pretty good, if not apocryphal information. You know, it's kind of um, a lot of newspaper articles like these you have to take with a grain of salt because they, there's not a re lot of research that goes into them. It's more um, interviewing people. And so their memories might, might not be that good or they might enhance the significance of an area based on what they know, based on local folklore or whatever. But they can also, but these kinds of articles, these general interest articles can provide some information that's helpful. Um, so the best place to go to find historical newspapers is either Utah Digital Newspapers um, or newspapers.com that's run by ancestry.com. And um, these both have a pretty good database of, of um, newspapers you know of course the utah digital newspapers is for utah newspapers only um, ancestry.com or, or the newspapers.com is nationwide maybe worldwide i haven't looked that much into this one but um but for utah i would try digital use utah digital uh, newspapers first and you can basically just type in a, a date the newspaper name or search newspaper names um, and then do keyword searches. You know, if you're looking for the owner of a property, you just type their name in and let it do its thing and see what articles it brings up for that person. Um, you can research, you know, some newspapers had, uh, you know, a what's being built in town sections, real estate sections, um, more so in the past than they do now, but um, those are useful to search as well. 
for the Friar Hotel, this was a, um, a little general interest article talking about uh, R.G. Friar um, didn't feel that the prospect of new railroad from Corinne through uh, Deweyville was of a positive character, character and tried to discourage people of Deweyville from going ahead and making improvements. <laughs> he is putting up a good hotel at that, at that place, taking chances on Deweyville being the railroad center. So he's kind of a local business, um, you know, cheer cheerleader, and so he's trying to get, um, you know, people to know that he's trying to build a population in his town and get people out there to stay at his hotel. So this is one type of, of information you can find that's very useful and was useful for the research of this property. Again, and then there's these general interest type. This is for the. Um, the Fred Meyer house actually up in the avenues talking about restoring that one. So there's different types of articles you can get from newspapers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about obituaries in a minute, which are found in newspapers. Um, the next thing uh, are the Polk City directories. And these are a very valuable resource. Um, our, the state history um, collections has a pretty good collection of um, the major uh, cities on the Wasatch Front, um, the Polk directories. These were published every year. They were basically um, the phone book and business book um, and whatever else of the time. They provide some good information. Um, and these have been scanned and are searchable. Um, I don't know if the complete collection has been scanned. Maybe somebody can help me out on that. But um, these were just a couple of weeks ago were just put online through Marriott Collections. And um, there are a number of these for different cities and counties uh, throughout Utah that you can go search online now, instead of having to look at the, the old books in the reference centers. Here's a typical page from a, uh, from a Polk City directory. So this is for, um, this is looking at Fred Meyer, uh, that house I was just telling about prior to that in the article. Um, so there's a just some basic information you can find here. So we're looking at Fred Meyer, who's a clerk. And um, so he is, let's see, second south. And I don't know what the WB stands for. Maybe this might can tell me. Um, so, but he lives on second south in Salt Lake City between 9th and 10th East. So this is before they started putting numbers on properties um, for addresses. And I think this one dates prior to 1920, um, sometime around then, this particular city directory. But it also tells you, um, so there's some basic information, tells you where they live for one thing, but it also tells you what their occupation is. So um, he's a salesman. And this being take the information at the time that it was, it's mostly going to be men in here that you see, unless the woman is single and living on her own. But you can see different some of the different professions here. Um, H.A. Messenger works in the Mint Saloon. Charles Metcalf is a baker. Um, John Metz works at Philadelphia Brewery and Saloon. Um, so this can provide some really basic information, but it can also help you a little bit about the biographical information. And again, most of these are now available online to, to search. Um, so the next thing um, kind of close to what the city directory is, is the, the Utah State Gazetteer, which are also put out by the, the RL Polk and Company. This is basically like a city directory, but it's for businesses. And um, it can provide information on, you know, what businesses are in town. Um, and so you can look if you're researching a particular commercial building for what businesses were there, these are very useful to, to look at. And I think these are also part of that Polk directory um, uh, services been scanned in the, online at the um, University of Utah Digital Collections. So here is a typical page from uh, a gazetteer looking again back at the Friar Hotel. Um, this is the 1892-93 gazetteer for Deweyville. Um, not a lot of town or businesses in town at that time. Um, I don't see anything for the Friar Hotel yet. 
there are a couple of blacksmiths um, and general merchandise, carpenter. I don't know what lime is unless he's a lime slacker or something. A um, couple of mer mercantiles, but not, not a lot of businesses in Dewey, Deweyville at that time. We go to 1900, which is eight years later. See the formats change a little bit. Um, so for Deweyville, we see some of the, the different um, information here. And there's still not a Dewey Hotel at that time. There's a railroad agent, there's a stock person, a blacksmith, general store, a surveyor, justice of the peace, another blacksmith, a postmaster, and a general store and railroad agent. Don't see anything about the, the Dewey or the Friar Hotel in 1900 yet either. Then you go to 1903, 04, and all of a sudden there it is, the RC Friar Hotel. So again, these can help you narrow down when a business goes into business or when a building was constructed. So that kind of narrows down. Um, we can assume that the, the building was, was built specifically for a hotel. So it was built sometime between 1900 and 1903. I think these are the only copies available. I don't know how often they updated the, the gazetteers. If there was one for 1901 or 1902, that could help narrow it down even more. So again, um, that's how you use these, um, the gazetteers and the Polk City directories. Um, you can also use the Polk directory to compare your, um, your property search, your title search with. So you can go to whenever prop, when you've noted in the title search when a property has changed hands um, and you have a new owner, you can compare that with the information you get from the city directory and see if that person is actually living there. That gets a little complicated if the property is a rental, which a lot of, um, say, if you're researching the avenues, a lot of those homes were rentals um, for most of the, their lifespan. So it might be a little more difficult to use the city directory to compare with your title search to make sure you researched everything correctly on that. Um, another thing regarding the city directories, um, the, the one that I showed you, well, even looking at this, typically you have to know a name to search, so they're all alphabetized um, by name in a particular city. So if you only have an address of a building, that's not gonna help very much because um, say you wanted to see who lived there, prior to 1925, you couldn't search just an address. You had to know the name and find them in here. Starting, I think it was 1925, they added a section where they reversed that. So you could research a property address Go look up that address in the city directory and it would tell you who lived there at that time. So that was a nice change they made in the mid 20s. So when you're doing research, you will find that probably the, the only information you're going to find is in an obituary. And that's because most people, you know, they were pretty basic in their life, especially as you go along, you get a bigger population. There wasn't as much biographical information generally kept on people made in public record. And so the only information that was really publicly made was when a person died and they published an obituary. So um, there are a couple of ways you can research obituaries. You can go online as is shown here, um, legacy.com. And these, I think these only provide more recent obituaries. Utah obituaries from Utah newspapers on the family search, you can go to that search page. And that has everything digitized back to the earliest newspapers, which I think was maybe Deseret News starting in the 1850s. So that's a very useful one to, to research um, obituaries. Or you can do it the old school way, um, go to our research center when it opens up and look at microfilm like I used to do um, back when I was a consultant. Um, and they would have alphabetized names on microfilm and they'd have a little card written up, these handwritten cards, or later on they were typewritten um, as technology in, improved at the historical society. And so you could see if an obituary was published in either the Tribune or the Deseret News. And typically that applied to most of the state at, in the early days. If you lived in a rural area, you would still publish your, um, your obituary in the larger 
uh, Salt Lake City newspapers as well. And so if you go to these obituary cards um, on microfilm, they would have the, uh, the newspaper that the obituary was published in. You just look for the person's name, it would show the newspaper date and then the page on which the obituary was published on. Then you would go to the microfilm for that newspaper and look up that um, page and you get a copy of that. I think on that legacy, um, or on this family search, this pretty much takes all that work away and you can automatically find the actual obituary online. So here's the obituary for Robert C. Fryer of the Fryer Hotel. And it looks like he was, he made a name for himself. This is a pretty good sized obituary for the time. And obituaries can provide some really good basic information when they were born, where they were born, um, areas they lived in prior to where they died, um, and then what they did for a living. Of course, unfortunately, if you're a female, there's probably not going to be this much information, unfortunately, um, until, you know, within the last 50 years or so, it was always the big white man that got all the information written about him. So, um, Fortunately, that's starting to change. So um, this is a, a very good detailed um, obituary and provides probably most of the information that we know about Robert Pryor. Um, unfortunately, if you were a farmer somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, your obituary is not gonna be this detailed, probably because you can afford to pay for a larger one in all the newspapers. So it might just be very basic, but you can still get some good information. Um, you can see that he was from Lincolnshire, England, and then moved over here who he married, um, and then what they did for a living. So this is a, a great obituary. So obituaries and then census can be very useful data as well. And most of these are available online. I think most places you have to pay a fee to access the, the scanned obituaries and searchable ones. Um, but this, gives you some basic information. Again, it goes by the head of household. As you can see over here on the side, it will give the, the last name of the, of the male head of household or of the female if, there is, if they're not married. Or um, if they're polygamous, um, it may have just the woman's name, the, the one wife's name and their children with no mention of the, the husband. And I found that to be the case with my great, great grandfather down in Pine Valley who had four wives but each one was, of course, listed individually because they were living in separate homes at that time. Um, but it, this also provides their birth date, um, how many uh, are in the household living there at the time of the obituary, or sorry, the census, mixing up my terms here, um, what their birth um, state or their birth country was and so forth. And you can use comparative um, census data to see when, um, if you're still trying to determine who lived in the house when, um, when they lived in that house or when they moved out, whatever, um, when certain people left the household and so forth. So census data is very, very useful. Um, and of course, the problem comes in if you're researching in a town that didn't have house numbers on properties, it's kind of Hard to determine. You have to use some deduction skills to figure out if they're talking about the particular house you're looking at. Um, I know some towns, like in San Francisco County, didn't even start numbering their properties until late 1980s. So uh, I'm sure that was the case in a lot of uh, other rural areas. Um, so census data um, is only released 70 years prior to the current date um, on at each decade. So the most recent census data available right now would be um, the, let's see, what was 70 years ago from, <laughs> would be 1950 is the most recent census data available. And that's to protect um, people who are still alive, protect their information. And unfortunately, um, the 1890 census, most of that was destroyed in a large fire at the Census Bureau building in DC. Uh, only a few of those records were saved. Um, and so for the most part, the 1890 census data is gone, which is unfortunate because that, that was kind of a, a popular year for researching when a lot of things were happening. So uh, fire couldn't have happened at the worst time at the Census Bureau. Um, 
to, to destroy all that data. And I know we have a lot of genealogists out there um, who also research homes, and you probably know way more about this than I do, but genealogy is, um, genealogy sites are making so much of this information available just in one or two clicks, as opposed to you having to go and do all the research on your own. They're, they're great crowdsourcing sites now. Um, I found information on my ancestors I didn't even know was out there that was provided by people just scanning and uploading to these sites like ancestry.com or family tree or, uh, or family search, I mean, um, and any one of a number of others. Um, and so um, a lot of these, uh, most of them, I think you have to pay a small fee to be uh, to access, but I think most of you do that anyway. Um, but this can even help you. This is another resource for photographs. I found um, my great, great grandfather, well, great, great, great grandfather came over from Scotland um, in the early 1800s. Um, and I knew he ran a tavern there um, prior to leaving. He kind of left middle of the night after um, an insurrection broke out in that part of Scotland. And so he immigrated with his family to um, Canada and then down into Utah in the 1840s. But um, I found a photograph of his house um, in, in Scotland that I had no idea was available. And it's really cool. I also found one of, a, one of my ancestors in Massachusetts found a photograph of their house from the 1700s there. So um, people publish you know, their family histories there. So they're all available. Um, a lot of them on this website, if you have family members or relatives who are big into family history um, and keep these kind of things um, up, updated on these websites. Family histories are a great item if there is one. Not everybody was um, in the early days wrote, let alone kept a history. And so that's why so much of history is of the, the rich and powerful because they're the only ones that kept track of their lives or had the, the um, I guess the resources to do that and the circumstances to do that. Your typical person who worked out in the fields probably didn't know how to write or um, didn't have the time to write because they're, you know, spending all their time working. So much of our history is of the, the rich and famous and powerful. But um, there are resources, like I said, on these, uh, like Family Search and, and um, Ancestry, that you may find copies of family histories that people have had and uploaded there. There are um, sources um, available, like the church history libraries and the and like BYU has resources that they've collected over the years. Um, and I'm sure University of Utah does as well. Um, biographical indices and encyclopedias, these are pretty common in the late 18 or late 1800s and early 1900s. Again, mostly for the for the rich and famous people. Um, but the most common one is this pioneers and prominent men of Utah. I don't know if this one's available, if anybody has ever scanned this one and made it available online, but these are in most university reference centers. It's basically a biographical encyclopedia that you just look up alphabetized names and they'll have a paragraph or two written about that person. And they might even have a photograph of the person as well. Um, a great one that I found researching was uh, this, this was like a, a research project at BYU and it's called Mormons and Their Neighbors. And it's not just for Mormons, it's for most of the, the settlers um, from the late 1800s. And they, this was a student project. They just scanned all of the various biographical um, encyclopedias and indices that were available in the region and um, put, got a name. And then they put them in this, this basic, it's just a guide to look and find where, uh, what, um, different biographical encyclopedias the person you're looking for is mentioned in. So you can look up a name. So here's Robert Fryer, R.C. Fryer from the, the Fryer Hotel. Um, if you look in here under his name, it shows that he is in, um, has a listing in Pioneers and Prominent Men, um, page 80, and then there's a photograph of him on page 414. So then you can go to that particular resource and find 
what information you can on him there. I can't remember what all these different acronyms stand for, um, but there's a, a kind of a little guide at the front of this that shows what each of these sources are. And then you can go look them up in that source if it's available at your reference library. Um, there's, there was this a companion, Pioneer Women of Faith and Fortitude that was published later on after pioneers and prominent men. So this gives, um, this is another one of uh, women that uh, have any biographical information that was collected as well. Um, and then Guide to Mormon Diaries and Autobiographies. This is a guide to let you know if, if there's um, on record at, a, at BYU at least, um, any scanned um, diary or autobiographical information. And then some other ones, Encyclopedic History of the, of the Church and the Biographical Encyclopedia. These were both um, done by the, the LDS Church. And these provide brief histories of people and of communities based on records they kept in their towns. And Andrew Jensen was like the, the main uh, church historian back at the, the early 1900s. And so he kind of went around compiling all of this information. And some more business oriented ones, Utah Historic Domain um, and Utah Since Statehood. These all have similar information in them. These are all available in the state or, or the um, yeah, state history uh, collections reference center. And I'm sure University of Utah, BYU have copies of these as well. And then these kind of um, series of, of uh, historical events. These are all um, ones published by Kate Carter when she was over state history. Um, and uh, so it was a series of things that they compiled information from throughout the state. So it gave them these very romantic names, um, heartthrobs of the West, our pioneer heritage, treasures of pioneer history. Um, so they're, they're a resource, local, um, local histories, are, are another great resource, which most of these were done by the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers starting in the 1930s. Um, they provide good general information and some useful biographical information, but you have to kind of take a lot of it with a grain of salt as a lot of it as anecdotal information. So dates and other um, more technical things might not be accurate. Um, these were updated like during the, the National Bicentennial in the 1970s, a lot of Locals, uh, localities updated these guides. Um, and then in the 1990s, state history uh, put out a number of, got some grant money to publish county histories for each of the counties. And they compiled their information. I think a lot of the researchers for those got a, a lot of the information from these county histories. So some of the inaccuracies have been perpetuated as these things get republished in different forms. So it's good not to take it too seriously, some of the information in these. Um, so here's the Deweyville town centennial. This mentions uh, Robert Fryer building a commodious hotel. He also has a livery and stable operated in the back. Uh, Fryer Hotel mentioned again. Um, the Box Elder County history again mentions this because Deweyville is in Box Elder County. So this is uh, again, brought up in the county history. So um, those are some good sources if you're looking for older information. This doesn't apply to more recent since the 1960s or so. And then you start getting more um, online sources to research. So some other sources other than um, the hard copies of books or, or their scanned um, copies. There's the Utah Historical Society website, um, the State Historic Preservation Office website, um, the SHPO hub, which is our buildings viewer. And you can just search, see what we already have, um, see if we have some information on a building in our database. And then you can contact us if you want to see if we can find your property in our database and then see if there's any research on it already available. And then our scanned building files. Um, 
are, we are in the process of scanning all of our paper files. This started probably a year or so before the pandemic hit, and we were starting to get things scanned at that time. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and that uh, kind of um, pushed us to to get this done faster. We've got most of Salt Lake, I think all of Salt Lake County, all of Utah County scanned. And then um, we're starting on, I can't remember, Chris Hans, maybe you can remind me which ones we're gonna be starting on next, maybe Weber County. Uh, San Pete County is also scanned. Um, they're not, all the information isn't quite available online yet. They're still being processed with metadata, but um, Utah County was first. I think all that is online. So if, if we had information in our files, and um, like hard copy information, then it was scanned and now you can research it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, just to show you. So here's the Utah State History website. Um, and for more, many of you who don't know this, um, the State Historic Preservation Office used to be part of um, the Division of State History Starting in May, legislature changed that. So we are our own office. In, we're still under the um, Department of Community and Cultural Engagement, but we're a separate office from state history now. It was just felt that our kind of our um, whole um, makeup was different from the rest of state history. Our, what we do is different. So they made us a separate office altogether. Here's our current Historic Preservation Office um, website. That will be changing in the near future um, as because of our split from state history, but I'm assuming it'll work pretty much the same. But on our history website, you can see what National Register nominations are being um, reviewed at the time and what has recently been listed. You can get information on historic preservation tax credits, if you're part of a certified local government, you can go there um, to this page and get more information. And then other building resources um, regarding restoring your building, researching your building and so forth. So uh, it's a good site to just find basic information on. This is our database website of files. So our hub, which is the buildings viewer, it's a GIS enabled database. You can go and search a property or a neighborhood there um, click on it, it brings up a, um, information on that building if we have some in our database. And then if the, the building file has been scanned, there's a, there's a link to that. You can click on it, it'll take you to the scanned file. So it's a very useful and continually updating uh, website. Uh, this is our basic tabular database um, page. You can't access it, but we can if you have a question on a property. And then this is our um, buildings um, records search page to see if you have a, if there's any scanned information on your property. And if you wanna contact us directly, here's all of our information in SHPO. Um, our, got a great staff, they're all very helpful. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but we're, we're a blend of historic buildings people and archeologists, so. And we make one big happy family. And so that's how to research your property. Um, I have, maybe we'll take a, a quick break here, if that's okay. I have a little bit more on documenting properties. I don't know if we wanna see that or not. Um, um, I think I think it's good if, if we um, take a break. Um, yeah. Just so everyone, okay. So everyone, um, if you have any questions, you know, again, feel free to either Put them in the chat, Q and A, or, or raise your hand. We've been answering questions as as we've been going along. Um, we'll take a five minute break, and then we'll come back. And um, Corey will talk about the National Register, and then we will take another ten minute break, and then we'll get to Amber. All right. Sounds good. Hey, Corey, just so you know, you have, when they get back from their break, you have until 11, which is about oh, 50 minutes from now. And then I'm going to cut you off cold turkey. So Great. Amber, so Amber, so we can have like a 10 minute break and then Amber can, um, 
Amber can have at least an hour. <laughs> yeah, I think this section will probably take about a half hour. Or so okay, I'll I'll watch the clock. Well, I can I can watch it for you, and if you're getting close, I can say ten minutes or five minutes, whatever works for yeah. you. Okay, what's in the chat? Right, let's see. Um, it was a chat about the PDF on how to research your building because right now the link's broken on our website because we updated that PDF. Oh, yeah. um, and if anyone's listening here on their break, we are getting a new website because our office became a new division recently. And so everything's in flux um, at the moment, but we will send up a follow-up email with PDF links to things or PDFs to make sure you guys have all the inf information that you need. All right. Hey, Corey, Rachel put in the chat, she would be interested in doing a hands-on experience with doing a title search. I see that. Yeah. Um, I'll just answer. Let's see. Um. Maybe I stepped away for a second, so maybe I missed, but did you, are there other things that would be beneficial to do a hands-on, um, you know, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like a hands-on experience with, um, yeah. cause it, I mean, because doing research involves, again, like going to the deed office or doing all these other kinds of. I Yeah, it's I, not something we could do. That's why I'm just going to tell her to go to the Morgan County Recorders. I mean, we could maybe in the future, once we have time. <laughs> I, yeah, I think we could do like just a Salt Lake City or or Orem or wherever is convenient for Corey. <laughs> but um, do, because I do no, like, see more I, examples of the, of what kinds of things you find and how you go from there, like I think would be really beneficial. Um, but I'm wondering if there's like other research things, if it's something that like we would want to do like a, a field school or like a, a two-day workshop on a couple of different things, you know? Yeah, that'd be great. And what I would recommend is actually, since I don't have a lot of hands-on experience in the last, you know, 20 years doing yeah. this. Yeah, somebody else, maybe. And somebody else, especially title search, because that has changed so much since when I did them. You know, everything's digitized now. For my class um, that I was teaching at the U, I actually had Sherry Ellis um, show up and kind of step in through a more okay. kind of recent one. But even she, you know, I was kind of surprised because um, she was just like, yeah, I think you do this. And I thought, oh, I thought you were, because because they'd actually put out, that's when she was with, with um, Swicka. And they'd actually put out a guide to how to research or how to title search. But it's really something, it's hard to teach a group of people because they're, they're, Offices are busy. Yeah. So um, that's why I'm recommending, I'm just going to put in this chat to Rachel just to go talk to the county recorder and have them. Yeah, know. I guess like Alina, when you and I were in grad school, it was mostly like we got taken to the recorder and I feel like the recorder was like, this is what you do. So exactly. That's usually how it works. So maybe, maybe, or maybe we could get like book a time with with somebody at the recorder's office and have them do an intro to like five to ten people or something. And I do yeah. know there's some recorder's offices that have online webinars on how to search things. So I attended one recently for Tooele, I think. So that might be an option to pursue just, again, to contact the recorder's office, um, be like, what, can, what do you guys offer in terms of training or how to get familiar with your records and what's available? Yeah, um, that's a good idea. I'm ready to list down in my notes. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring that up when I start my next segment. Okay. 
Well, I mean, it's been five minutes. Corey, yep. if you want to dive into National Register,